Hello, this is Chartered Accountant Omkar Gargir. On behalf of TaxWise Advisory Services Private Limited, I welcome you all for the clause-wise analysis of the budget provisions for the year 2022. Now, with respect to the upcoming, I mean, with respect to the budget for the financial year 2021-22, the provisions which have been laid down right now in the finance bill, with respect to the central goods and services tax and the integrated goods and services tax, we will be willing to have a clause-wise discussion. In the best interest of the listeners, it is advised that if you have the provisions of the existing law as well as the, the budget speech or the bill, finance bill, which has been brought under the, on the table today by India House, if you are in a position to have those text on with you, it will be the in the most beneficial position for you. Nonetheless, we will try to cover as much ground as possible. Now, if if an overall perspective of the budget is taken into consideration, there have been changes in the goods and services tax laws or the proposed changes, I must say, till the time it gets the assent from the Honorable President. Now, with respect to the specific provisions which has been causing a lot of disturbances in, in the industry as well as among the consultants and in the taxation uh, offices with respect to the reconciliation of input tax credit or where, has, where there has been a massive number of notices which have been issued for the mismatch of the credits which have been taken and the credits which were visible in the GSTR 2A returns and then followed by that there was a GSTR 2B return. In order to sort out a lot of such problems, the problem regarding the chargeability of interest on the net payment or the gross payment which was only clarified by way of a notification earlier or through a press release earlier, it has also been amended or proposed to be amended in the law in itself. So starting from the very first change which has been brought in the Goods and Services Tax Act, the first is in Section 7, the provisions of Section 7 which co cover the scope of supply. Section 7 from the beginning has got amended twice already when the CJC Amendment Act 2018 was made and as well as, as after that there was a change when the, the Schedule 2 was regulated. As on today, what is the most uh, important change which has been brought in is there is an additional clause which has been inserted in the provisions of section 7 subsection 1 and that 7 subsection 1 clause double A has been inserted to introduce the activities or transactions which are carried out by a, any, by a person other than an individual for its to its members or constituents or vice versa for cash or deferred payment or other valuable consideration. Explanation which has been also given it is that for, I mean, it is hereby clarified that notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the timing in force, any judgment or decree or any under any other order of the court, the person and its member or constituent shall be deemed to be two separate persons and supply of the activities or transaction inter se shall be deemed to take place from one such person to another. Now, the very perspective of this provision, I believe, is that earlier in the schedule 2, this entry was covered. And whereas it was in the category of predefined category of supply of goods. So I believe for the institutions or for the organization or for the associations which are providing goods as well as services to its member for any cash or deferred payment. I believe in order to broaden the horizon of these transactions, this provision, I mean this particular entry has been brought in under the scope of supply. And in order to ensure the taxability, especially when it is going from one person or the association to its member. The only thing that they've kept out of the purview is that individual providing any services or individual providing any goods with respect to this provision will not be taken into taxability. Otherwise, any other person other than individual, if he is providing any activities. Now, they have brought the word activities in order to only probably bring into force the goods as well as services collectively in it. So that is the first and foremost change which has been brought in. The second change which comes through the provisions of section 16. Now this is one of the very biggest change what I believe is because of the current scenario, the disputes that were there over the rule 36 sub rule 4, the availability of credit, the availability of credit with respect to 120% which was there in the last year 2019 October around. Then it was reduced to 110% then it was reduced to 105% of the eligible credit which is appearing in your GSTR 2A. Subsequently it was brought in 2B. Now the provisions which are proposed to be amended are, so there in section 16, in section 16 subsection 2 that is the conditions by which the input tax credit is only been eligible. So the earlier section 16 subsection 2, there, there is a new clause that has been inserted is clause double A. Earlier the clause section 16 subsection 2 clause A says, 
he is a person shall not be claim, I mean, eligible to claim input tax, entitled to claim input tax credit unless he is in possession of a tax invoice, debit note or a uh, debit note issued by the supplier registered under this act or such other tax paying documents as may be prescribed. In addition to this, there is this clause double A which has been inserted. Now, what does clause double A say? The details of the invoice or debit note referred to in clause A furnished by the supplier in the statement of outward supply and such details have been communicated to the recipient of such invoice or debit note in the manner specified under section 37. So I believe now there are only two things which are clear on this basis. In the long run this probably 105 or 120 or 110 percent whatever mechanism was brought in for the, uh, for the non-appearing credit in your GSTR 2A or 2Bs will completely go away. The input tax credit with respect to those transactions on which the tax is payable under the forward charge mechanism where I as a recipient I was only giving the money to my supplier he was paying tax to the government. In all such cases the input tax credit will be only on the basis of that details which is appearing in my GSTR 2A or 2B I mean 2B I should say. So my credit will now be only available if it details are appearing by virtue of filing of GSTR 1 by my supplier. Now, even for those suppliers for whom quarterly return under the QMRP is applicable, they are supposed to have this IWF invoice, uh, invoice furnishing facility. So even if they have furnished those invoices with respect to that transaction, I'll be eligible to claim because as the provision says, it only says the details of invoice or debit note referred to in clause A has been furnished by the supplier in the statement of outward supplies and such details have been communicated to the recipient. What I believe is that currently the gap which was getting created for the quarterly filers because I was not in a position to claim the input tax credit if my supplier was a quarterly filer and he would file his GSTR one only after a specific time. So now even going forward what may happen is that even if the IFF is done that may be considered as a communication facility of that the credit has been the tax in respect of the transaction or the transaction has been reported by my supplier and basis that I will be able to take the credit. So I believe this is only if the effective functioning of the IFF and the quarterly filers is really happening on a real time basis, this provision will be helpful. And secondly, yeah, there were a lot of issues because of the misbehaving suppliers who are not filing their returns or who are not being compliant. Now today, the only thing that one needs to take care about is business is that communicate with all your vendors at the earliest possible and then finalize the terms that if there is a if there is no you know uploading of details by the supplier within the due time which is allowed allowed under the law i believe that is going to let you lose your credit at least for that month so one needs to really take a business call with respect to that and maybe communicate to all your vendors whether they are small or big or whether they are large or small firms we need to really be very strict with respect to the acceptance of this purchases from such vendors because a vendor who is good in standing as well as a vendor who is going to be absolutely compliant on a due time only such vendor will be should be somebody who you who should you should welcome probably or have him on board even if you are having a composition supplier no problem even if you are having an unregistered supplier no problem but a registered supplier if you are having on board then he has to be a very very disciplined and compliant registered supplier so that is the key takeaway by what one can take so even if you are communicating to your clients please be careful about this and at the earliest of communication, if it is going, going forward, all these disputes of non-appearing of input tax credit will, will be taken care of. And rather it will be helping you in the capacity or helping a business in the capacity of going for a smooth transition of a tax return. The next biggest thing that is a dent to a lot of aspirations in terms of the chartered accountants or the cost accountants. Certification under provisions of section 35 subsection 5 as it was envisaged in the original existing provisions. The section 35 subsection 5 provisions have been asked to be omitted as per the proposed bill. So section 35 subsection 5 specifically covered a provision saying every registered person whose turnover during a financial year exceeds the prescribed limit shall get his accounts audited by a chartered accountant or a cost accountant and shall submit of a copy of the audited annual reconciliation statement under subsection 2 of section 44 in such and in such form and manner as we prescribed. Now, if this provision is eliminated, the only impact is that a certification by a chartered accountant or a cost accountant goes away. That doesn't mean that the client is not going to face the GST audit or a client is not going to have the GST reconciliation to be done. The provisions have been of the reconciliation are proposed to be incorporated in the provision of section 44. Section 44 proposed provisions stand as every registered person other than the input district input district uh, input service distributor, a person paying tax under section 51 and 52, that is TDS TCS provisions. 
or a casual taxable person and a non-resident taxable person barring all these every person is supposed to furnish such an annual return which we, which may include which may include a self certified reconciliation statement reconciling the value of supplies declared in the return furnished for the financial year with the audited financial statements of every financial year electronically within such time and manner in such form and manner as may be prescribed now over here what is happening is that the certification because it shifts from the char from the chartered accountant or a cost accountant it has shifted to self certification basis as much as i believe there is no takeaway from i mean like non doing of reconciliation is not going to take place reconciliations will still have to be done the only thing is that the attest function and the audit responsibility per se is going to be a part, i mean is going to be going away basis this proposition which has been brought in so of course in terms of a professional aspiration this can create some sort of a vacuum but then that is how it is we need to take the provisions as they are coming All, although in terms of reconciliations i as i said earlier that your clients are still going to need your help so from the chartered accountant cost accountant point of view you can still you know create to have this opportunities in terms of this regard with where you can assist them in preparing these reconciliations because ultimately there will be a comfort point at the clients and also if somebody else has prepared the reconciliation and a thorough revision on the thorough check has been done with respect to these figures facts and figures which will be self reported as that leads to a greater responsibility on the end of the client who is going to certify these accounts or the reconciliation on his own going forward as much as i see that they are also they have also mentioned that wherever the there are that is necessary the annual returns the annual returns will be given a relief from and the taxpayers will be given a relief from filing the annual returns now the as we have currently the limits are based on the basis of turnover similar limits will be carried forward in the in the uh, times to come that up to 2 crores probably there will be no annual returns 2 crore and above i believe that uh, self certification will be kept now this is only why i am saying i believe because there is nothing specifically mentioned in the provision proposed provisions as yet the next which is there that is the i mean the next amendment which has been proposed is in section 50 sub section 1 although this amendment was already being brought into the practical application by all of us for a long time because Uh, the tax, the interest which is payable on the late payment of tax from the due date to the actual date of payment, the interest under fifty subsection one, which was being taxably, I mean, which was being charged charged on the basis of the gross amount of tax. In the last year, we had this proposed uh, clarification. I mean, we had this clarification from the honourable finance minister that the uh, interest should be levied on the net provision, I mean, net portion of the tax payable, that is the cash liability. So, if your gross liability is five lakh rupees, your Input tax credit is which is eligible. Input tax credit eligible for the month is four lakh fifty thousand, and the net cash liability if it is fifty thousand. So if this amount of tax is being paid on a delayed basis, your liability exposure only stands to the amount to the extent to be calculated on fifty thousand rupees. That is the net cash liability. Till now the problem was because there was no explicit provision under the law. There was still a lot of notices being issued which were being calculated on the gross basis, and then people had to give an explanation or we were giving an explanation to the officers. that this calculation should be done on the net basis and not on the gross basis but because of the lack of existing existing provision under the law it was becoming becoming difficult at times for the people to you know deal with this problem but going forward this provision has been incorporated proposed to be incorporated in the provisions of section 50 sub section 1 so this looks like i mean this is kind of a welcome move because it is going to help us to pay the in necessary interest only on the net tax liabilities net of the input tax credit but again please remember the input tax credit needs to be the eligible input tax credit only which is appearing now as per the records the further amendments which were brought uh, in further amendments which have been proposed to be brought in are in terms of the provision of section 74 section 75 so over there only the specific explanation which has been inserted that for the purpose of this subsection the expression self assessed tax shall include the tax payable in respect of details of outward supplies furnished under section 37 but not include new but not included in the return furnished under section 39 now this is i believe that the self assessed tax which they are also trying to bring in the differential i mean the tax which has been declared in sec in gstr 1 but not in gstr 3b so what what they are specifically trying to say is that self assessed tax shall include the tax payable in respect of details of outward supply furnished under 37 that is gstr 1 return but not included in the return furnished under section 39 so as currently we are having a lot of notices being received for the differences between the outward taxable supplies declared in gstr 1 and 3b 
so they are proposing to bring the self as they are rather they are proposing to expand the base of the terminology self assess tax to this to include this tax as well which is the differential liability between your gstr1 and gstr3 b now uh, although this this is not going to make any significant impact per se that we need to really ponder upon or, uh, for a longer time the next that is there that is an amendment with respect to section 83 now this is again a minor procedural amendment as as much as i can say where after the initiation of any proceedings under the chapter uh, chapter 12 or 14 or 15 the commissioner is of the opinion that for the purpose of protecting the interest of the government revenue it is necessary to do so he may by order in writing attach provisionally any property including bank account belonging to the taxable person or any specified person in subsection 1a of section 122 in such manner as may be prescribed now i why i meant to say is this procedural because this currently what is happening is a freezing of accounts or freezing of Uh, assets of the bank account which used to take place on a very you know frequent basis under the BAT laws. Now that provision has been probably unfortunately extended over here. And currently there was only a silent move which was made in a lot of cases by the department that seems to be emerging again that we have this provision of section 122 which has been uh, brought in by giving the powers to the commissioner to attach. Yes, the only thing is that probably it will have to be reasoned. with a natural i mean with a definite justification as to why that attachment has been made so it will not be i mean we just hope that there will be no you know blatant use of power to a, in a wrong way and it will be correctly taken by the commissioners but yes nonetheless this is something which is which for which the business needs to be really aware that when they whenever they are having any kind of an attachment from the bank for uh, freezing of your bank accounts then the in the backlight of these particular provisions the power is now lying in the hands of the commissioner to take a legitimate decision but the validity or you can say the viability of this decision will have some repercussions if at all the pro- the powers are not correctly used by the uh, by the commissioners or by any of the officers but then the because the commissioner has been granted the power to determine uh, we we can really think that maybe there is a conscious decision making done by the commissioner in each every case to case basis now in section provision of section 107 and 108 the pre deposit provisions i i find that now with respect to section 107 the only thing that they have inserted is that provided that no appeal shall be filed against an order under subsection 3 of section 129 unless a sum equal to 25% of the penalty has been paid by the appellant i i am only worried that this pre deposit amount is going to be a huge one especially when the appeals are of a greater magnitude because the pro, the amendments which have been brought in in the provision of section 120 uh, in 107 subsection 3 so it says that uh, i mean 107 subsection 6 i am sorry no appeal shall be filed under the current provision says no appeal shall be filed under subsection 1 unless the appellant has paid in full such part of the amount of tax interest fine fee penalty arising from the impugned order and a sum equal to 10% of the remaining amount of tax in dispute so now what they say is in section 107 the following proviso shall be inserted namely provided that no appeal shall be filed and against an order under subsection 3 of section 129 unless a sum equal to 25% of the penalty has been paid by the appellant so i believe the focus is more shifted on the quantum of penalty in specific because as much as we had a pre deposit earlier in the earlier laws also the penalty and interest i mean the penalty tax and the liabilities used to be clubbed together for determining the pre deposits its its base has been increased so here there is some exposure that one may have if the alleged amount also includes a penalty amount so that is some additional cost which is going to be at least a cash flow issue that will be there to the business in certain scenarios likewise the amendments have been done in section 108 or uh, in section 129 of the central goods and services tax now section 129 which is specifically dealing with the provision so now detention regard the provisions regarding detention as we we have been aware that the detention which has taken place especially especially in cases of the uh, the halting of vehicles for non furnishing of the ewe bill or in incorrect furnishing of the ewe bill we have a uh, exposure with respect to that 129 subsection 3 says the proper officer detaining or seizing goods or conveyance shall issue a notice specifying the tax and penalty payable and thereafter pass an order for payment of tax and penalty under clause a or clause b or clause c now what does the current provision only take care of that i mean particular aspect is in subsection 
the following clause shall be inserted that on payment of a penalty equal to 200% of the tax payable on such goods and in case of such exempted goods on payment of an amount equal to 200% of the value of goods or 25,000 rupees whichever is less where the owner of the goods comes forward for payment of such penalty. I believe that uh, whenever there will be a seizure of goods, or, I mean by reason of your non-furnishing of EV bills or incorrect furnishing of EV bills because section 129 is all about the detention, seizure and release of the goods and conveyances in transit. There is a detailed, uh, I mean there is a detailed uh, discussion with respect to the applicable penalties and I think one mechanic, I mean one particular move that has been done or which I can see being done in this particular case is regarding the seizure and regarding the penalties which are applicable for the release of the goods so what from the experience so far we have had is that uh, the detention of goods takes a i mean a hell lot of a time for the people to really get their goods released or their goods stand for a longer time what they have probably done is that the, the time limit so also in the further section which we will bring it in our detailed write-up also the detailed provisions regarding the issuing of notices and then completion of the assessment for EV bill which had a shorter time now it has been given a span of time of around 15 days 7 days time to issue the notice 7 days time to respond and then for the release of goods of course the payment which is immediately made but now they have brought that cap up to 1 lakh rupees that in case of detention of goods by paying an amount of immediate amount paying of 1 lakh at least your vehicle will be released till the entire proceeding is completed the vehicle will not be held back this is probably something which will sort out the issues that the vehicles being detained for a long time and that that also used to cause a lot of hardships to the business because of uh, these provisions that their vehicles could not reach the customer so regulating overall that aspect i think that has been done there are uh, allied provision i mean there are allied uh, penalties that have been put with some clauses that's why we believe that we'll just uh, present the same with respect to the existing and uh, post existing scenarios with respect to a comparative chart that will give you a better understanding of this the next, uh, the next provisions which are, I mean, which will be something is are in regards to your uh, IGST provision under the IGST Act of the zero rated supplies. Now, in zero rated supplies, what has been specifically done is that uh, in subsection one of clause B, after the word supply of goods or services or both, the words for authorized operation shall be inserted. Now, this is a provision what they are referring to in section sixteen, subsection one. For subsection B, in the subsection 3 clause B, the following subsection shall be substituted. Now what is going to be happening over here is that uh, we've seen that so far a lot of people have tried to unnecessarily or sometimes you know mischievously try to obtain refunds for zero rated supplies. And in order to regularize that entire uh, refund mechanism for zero rated supplies, I believe these provisions have been inserted. So the first provision that is that they've made changes in in subsection 1 in clause B after the word supply of goods or services the word for authorized operation shall be inserted. So section 16 subsection 1 now that specifically is in relation to your zero rated supplies as much as it has been made for your I mean obviously the zero rated supplies which has been made with respect to the supplies by way of either now you had primarily only two mechanisms of making a zero rated supply it was with payment of tax and without payment of tax. Now, whenever there was a supply with payment of tax, obviously the IGST payment was eligible to be brought in under the refund mechanism. Where, whereas it was under the without, I mean, whereas it was under the mechanism of without payment of tax, then unutilized input tax credit refund was eligible only under two circumstances. One, it was in the case of export. Second, it was because if it was uh, under the inverted duty structure. As also mentioned by the honourable, uh, as also mentioned by the honourable finance minister in the budget speech today, the issues or the anomalies which are in relation to the inverted duty structures would be cleared off. Exactly what what uh, particular provisions they are bringing or changes under the rules are not there clear with us. But then yes, there is an intent which which mentions that there will be some changes which will be made with respect to these anomalies under the zero rated supplies. Now the next pro the next particular provision that it mentions is a registered person making zero rated supply shall be eligible to such claim I mean to eligible to claim refund of unutilized input tax credit on supply of goods or services or both without payment of integrated tax under a bond or LUT 
in accordance with the provision of section 54 of the cgst act or rules made there under subject to such condition safeguards as may and the procedure as may be specified so i'm forecasting a few changes in the procedure of refund which is right now i i definitely should say it is definitely very simple in terms of once the chain is set your refunds mechanisms are generally very easy but yes there will be a regularization to certain extent if at all they have noticed some mischievous refunds also most important provision that has been proposed to be brought in is that in case of non realization of sale proceeds especially in case of zero added supply of goods which has been mentioned in case of non realization of sale proceeds the refund so received is to be repaid along with interest under subsection 50 i mean under section 50 now this is something that what it says under the fema there is a time limit of 6 month which is generally prescribed under the law for getting the amount of i mean for getting the amount of foreign exchange realized if the amount is so not realized then the, the particular refund amount which needs to be deposited into the government's account so that this is definitely a welcome provision so unnecessary or wrong refund claiming procedure will at least be stopped in any case in terms of services why this provision was not necessary because anyways the ebrc or the uh, the if i mean ebrc copies were already taken on record so the data was already there with the government in case of goods because the procedure of refund is automated the cross check of of collection of the foreign exchange payment needs to be done So friends, this is so far as these are the few highlighted highlights what I wanted to discuss with you regarding the GST provisions. Our write up and a comparative chart will followed by today evening. I wish you all the best for the upcoming time with respect to the dealing of various laws and the notices they received there. Are. So I, I in terms of direct tax proposals, we've also had a, a detailed analysis which will be circulating from our side. So till then I wish to take your leave thank you so much have a good day ahead